It's a real privilege to be worshipping with you this morning. I helped build this church many years ago, which is an indication of my age. When I first came to Wangarei, we were worshipping in a small church around um, Norfolk Street, and uh, we thought that was pretty big. And um, this is much bigger, much brighter, and much newer than that was. Last Easter, I had dinner with some friends. And I must confess that I overindulged in those Easter delicacies. I didn't feel so good when I got home. I had a pain in my stomach. Well, I imagine it must be something that I'd eaten, obviously. And given some time, I'd either get over it or get rid of it. But after a few hours, six hours, of writhing on the floor, pacing the floor, squirming in anguish, I felt that it might be something more than just a bilious attack. And at four o'clock in the morning, I headed for the A&E. Diagnosis, you've got a bad gallbladder, a real problem. But they gave me some very strong painkillers and I started to feel better. And although they said to me, you should go down to the hospital, I was well enough to go home, but not for long. The pain returned. Those painkillers was just a temporary fix. I returned to the A&E and into hospital for urgent surgery. And I got to thinking that that was a bit like the human condition. We live in a constant state of tension, general fear and unease. Something's not quite right. Fear, future regrets, future regrets, past concerns, present worries, what might happen today on the motorway. General fear, but at times these reach a crescendo. It might be the death of a loved one or some act of gratuitous violence against us or someone we know. Sudden and acute pain, like I was suffering. As the poet Shelley said, life thou pendulum between smile and tear. One moment the calm, the next the storm. Now pain's a pain and I absolutely hate it and I'll do anything to avoid it. But it's a necessary evil. That pain told me to seek help. If it wasn't for the pain, I would have been blissfully unaware that something was festering down there and very soon it would kill me if I didn't do something about it in great haste. Years ago, I developed cancer of the colon. No pain at all. I can recommend it. I hadn't the faintest idea that I was dying. Well, of course, we're all dying, but this was imminent danger. And if I hadn't gone to the doctor when I did, he said, wow, how long has it been like that? I said, I don't know, you didn't get any pain. And uh, they said in the hospital that you've got six months. So I said, just our house in order, but that was in 1990, so praise the Lord, I'm still here. God whispers to us in our conscience. He talks to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pains. So physical pain tells us that something is wrong. It's same in the spiritual world. Pains of conscience. In fact, a good conscience is the sign of a very bad memory. We live with a sense of guilt that we haven't even lived up to our own standards. As I look over my life, I can't see much good. Very little good. But I can see a lot of mistakes. I can see things I've said and things I've done that still haunt me. They're sins of commission. But there's the other side as well. There are times when I've failed to do good that I should have done. Sins of omission. Did I do my utmost for my fellow man when he was in trouble? 
those lost opportunities. Even the French atheist Voltaire says something to that effect that man is responsible for all the good he didn't do. I meet a lady sometime, I go door to door occasionally with books and DVDs and stuff, and she said, I haven't got much time for religion. So we got to talking and I said to her, as you look over your life, um, are there any mistakes that you think you've made and any things you'd like to fix up? Um, how's your past? Well, I hit a soft spot. She hung her head. She said, there's a lot of things I'd like to fix up. And I said to her, well, that's what the Bible's all about. It's actually telling you how to fix the problems of the past and, of course, the future. We know that we fall short in every area of our lives. A constant missing the mark. In fact, that's what the word sin means, missing the mark. They used to use it, that word in archery. If you miss the bullseye, sin. And that brings embarrassment. The Bible says, right at the outset of human history, that God himself placed the idea, that feeling of a guilty conscience with us. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, your seed and her seed, and that's all of us. God places that feeling. Enmity means a feeling of hostility, a feeling of discord. And he's placed it within us. And so we're fascinated and yet repulsed by evil. We're drawn to sin, but repelled by it at the same time, enmity. Because that's what God uses to bring us to our senses. Notice that two words appear in the Genesis record. They were naked and they hid. Have you ever noticed the way uh, criminals act outside a court when they are found out in some nefarious activity? They hide themselves. Why? Because they feel naked and ashamed. That's what it really means. I saw a man the other day and he was up before the cameras and he pulled his T-shirt over his head and he put his cap on top and he talked through his T-shirt. He was feeling naked and ashamed because he'd been caught out. And that's what the word really means. It was literal, no doubt, but also figuratively it means naked and ashamed because they've been caught out and we suffer the same feelings ourselves. So right at the scripture, at the beginning of scripture, God holds out two ways to get rid of our spiritual pain. The first is... Oh, they sewed fig leaves together. Now, fig leaves have a weakness. They're okay for a short stay on a fine day. But the problem is they fall away. So what do you do then? Well, get sewing again. More fig leaves. Until there's no more fig leaves left, left because they all disappear in the winter. And that's judgment day. The Bible tells us that those fig leaves are idols. They're just substitutes. And the devil has a forest of fig leaves for every taste and every need and every desire of the human family. Anything to keep us distracted from the realities. Drugs, alcohol, all that goes with them. More insidious, of course, is a mad scramble of power, politics, fame, money, sports, retail therapy, whatever you like, there'll be a fig leaf to cover the innermost problems and the feelings. So what do you do? Well, get selling fig leaves again. More fig leaves to occupy the mind. Years ago in the theatres, when the curtain came down and they were arranging the furniture for the next act, someone would come out and keep the crowd occupied. Play a tune, tell some jokes, do some acts, whatever you like, just to keep them occupied while the furniture was being arranged behind. And suddenly the curtain was go up. And that's what fig leaves are like. Just keep you occupied, just a little covering, and suddenly it's judgment day. For me, a permanent 
a permanent fix regards something that God will do. The second choice is that he provided something. And he provided free of charge. No work, no sowing. And all they had to do was choose to accept it. In the story of the prodigal son, the father swept a new robe around all the pig-sized stuff, never seen again. The boy did nothing to deserve it. All he had to do was accept it. Free gift. Now, for me, a permanent fix required that I got rid of that offending appendage before it got rid of me. I wanted to be normal again. Well, as normal as I can be anyway. For those of you who know me, you know what I mean. And that's what the word repentance means. A turning around. A desire to be normal again. That's the cry of the human heart. Back to Eden. All of life's temporary fixes cannot quieten the guilty conscience. Remember those two men in the temple? The Pharisee said something to this effect. I know I'm a sinner, Lord, but I've done no major crime. And so I'll come to even song whenever I've got time. And Lord, reserve for me a crown and don't let my shears go down. But the publican said, I know I'm a sinner, Lord. I need help. And you're the one I'm coming to. And he's the one that was justified. There was one thing for certain. I couldn't fix the problem myself. I'm a builder. And imagine if I'd undone my shirt and got tearing down there with a Stanley knife. All the troubles I'd have been in. I needed someone to help me. All false religion is based on the principle, you can do it yourself. Just try harder. Pray more. Meditate. Be a good citizen. Well, they're all good, but they're not good enough. New Age, that sweeping the Christian church today is founded on that principle. You can do it. I met a man when I was away at a trip recently at an airport, and we had just about 30 minutes, and it turned into an intense conversation. He was a very well-educated Hindu, and he was anxious to tell me all the benefits of being a Hindu was. And it was a sort of verbal bombardment, if you get my drift. Well, I respectfully listened to him for quite a while, and I decided if I was going to get a word in edgeways, I'd have to be a little bit more authoritative than what I usually am. So I said, I want to ask you a question. I held up my hands and said, I want to ask you a question. And he stopped. And this is what I said. Have you noticed, well, I didn't say this to him, but have you noticed that Jesus asks questions throughout the New Testament. In the four Gospels, he asks about 100 questions and most of them he knows the answers himself. You see, the rabbis used that method of drawing people into a conversation. It was their method and Jesus was using the method of the day, parables and questions. Educators tell us that a man's intelligence is gauged by the questions he asks rather than the answers he gives. What's written in the law? How do you read? As if Jesus didn't know that. What do you want me to do? The blind men. Of course he knew what he wanted them, what they wanted him to do. Who do men say that I am? Well, he knew what men said that he was. That he was. Why call me good? The book of Revelation, he says, who are these in white raiment? Well, he knew he didn't know, but the questioner knew. What were you discussing on the way? As if Jesus didn't know. But he wanted them to say himself. Whose portrait is this on this coin? Do you love me, Simon? Well, he knew he loved him. Maybe it's a worthwhile approach when you meet people. Rather than telling them all the things you know, ask them a question. How do you feel, how do you feel about your life? Would you like it to change? It's a good way of approaching people. I've been using it much more myself since this particular occasion. Well, I went on and I said to him, 
I understand for you, a Hindu, the judgment comes at the end of your life. At the end of your life, God is going to weigh up your good deeds against the bad deeds. If you've done enough good deeds, you're going to go to one place and bad deeds, you're going to go to the other. You thought for a moment, he said, yes, that's about right. That is right. I said biblical Christianity is the opposite. Our judgment is at the beginning. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you be anything more than saved? That's enough for me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Well, that's good enough for me. I don't need any more than that. Well, as soon as I mentioned the word Christianity, he moved off again. Ooh, it went. He said, I know all about Christianity. And he told me all the schools he'd been educated in and all the Christian teachers. I said to him, hang on, I haven't finished yet. I've got more questions to ask you. I said to him, you know the stories of the Bible, but you've missed the message. You know, usually I think of what to say about two weeks after, if I can remember the conversation, but this just came out of my mouth. I said to him, um, I actually quite surprised at myself. And I went on to tell him this. The Hindu teaching is good advice. There's no question about that. It's good advice. But Christianity is good news. Hindu tells you what to do. Christianity tells you something that's already done. What would you rather have? And then I said, I want to illustrate it. What would you like me to do? Say to you, I'm going to put a million dollars in your bank account. It's free. It's yours. I don't want it back. You can do whatever you like with it. I just want to be your friend. Because I've got plenty and I want you to be happy. Or would you rather me say to you, if you work for the next 30 years in that mine down there, you may earn a million bucks. I'm not going to guarantee it, but you just might. Which would you rather me say to you? Because the first one is Christianity and the second one is Hindu. He said to me, what are you? I said, I'm a Christian. Oh, he said, there's more to it than that. What are you? Well, I said, I've been a clergyman most of my life. Well, time was coming and we had to part, but we swapped emails. Here's his email to me. It was nice to come to know you and your wife at Heathrow Airport, although I hope I did not talk too much to a person of divinity. I've never been called a person of divinity before. And then he goes on to tell me all the places he was educated and his background. And then he says, keep in contact and please... Give our kind regards to your wife, who was quite amusing herself while I was talking to you, as I did not know you were a reverend. Well, I hadn't been called a reverend before either. I got two appellations there I've never been called before. So seeing I couldn't fix the problem myself, I had to put myself in the hands of the experts. And they were close at hand, just over there at the hospital. And it's the same in the spiritual world. God is not far away from each one of us. Lo, I am with you always. Would you like to repeat that with me? Lo, I am with you always. I will, what about this one? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Would you like to say that with me? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that good news? I'm with you always, even unto the end and beyond. But it was my call. I had to make the call. I had to call in at the hospital. It's a bit easier in the Christian life. I've just got a call, that's all. I don't have to go to the hospital to call in. Call upon me, I will answer. It's very easy, you know, it's the first thing we learn to do. So call. First thing. And we don't need to be taught to call. A baby doesn't need to be taught to call. It just calls when it has an uncomfortable feeling. It's the first thing we do. And God says, that's the way to approach me, naturally. You'll feel uncomfortable. Call upon me. The Christian will be constantly seeking 
a closer walk with God. Oh, for a closer walk with God. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from your throne and worship only thee. Well, they wheeled me into the operating theatre. I was in a sort of state of fear and trembling, if you get my drift. Well, hypothetically speaking, I was past caring by the time I got there, actually. But it really, it was a rather solemn occasion. And they were all laughing and joking around. It sounded like a picnic. And I said to them, um, this is serious business, I said, it sounds like you're having a party down here. I could hear them clattering the instruments. They were laughing and talking to each other. And those instruments, in a few minutes, they were going to use on me. They said, uh, I said, I hope you got the whiskey bottle put away. They said, oh, no, they laughed. They said, that'll come out later. And I thought to myself, I hope it's after surgery and not after I'm going out to it. You see, they'd done this many times. No problems. All in a day's work for them. You see, God also is an expert at his task. It might seem so difficult to us to understand that he can treat us as righteous. Perfect in his sight when we know we're not. But somehow he can treat us as perfect. And we see all the horrible things in our lives. But he says, I can't see them. And I have difficulty understanding what that means. But he's promised and I believe it. But although it was easy for them, it hadn't always been like that. To get to that place where they could perform an operation of me had cost them the hard yards. They'd burnt the midnight oil. They'd studied till midnight. They'd spent a huge amount of money on their examinations just so they could operate on me. It didn't come easy. And so it is without great physician. With much anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sins with him there. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it where our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we'd esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Or we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Why? For the transgression of my people. That's why. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. You know, God wouldn't give Israel up, but he gave his son up. So much he loves us. That was my mother's, my mother's favourite text is coming. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Here's my mother's favourite text. He shall see the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail. You see, where the travail of his soul. Every one of us. When we're in the kingdom of heaven. In glory. Standing before the sea of glass. He can say, it's all worthwhile. Just that you be with me. I saw this attitude. 
as it were, in hospital. The surgeon would come around every morning. How are you feeling? Well, I said, I'm feeling absolutely fantastic, thanks to you and your team. It's wonderful to be free of the pain. And I could see a sort of smile of sort of pride. They were all laughing and joking around my bed. Some of the others, they weren't. They were in trouble and they hadn't got over their op. But I was fantastic and I told them so and I thanked them so much. When a sinner comes to Christ, he's coming to an expert. Our salvation is his glory. His glory. You know, um, I wrote a letter to the hospital and uh, I took a long time about it. And I told them how much I appreciated all the things they'd done for me while I was in hospital. I even said, some people, I heard them complaining about the food. It was adequate. I didn't expect a gourmet restaurant. It was adequate. So pass on my regards to the kitchen as well. That You guys did a fantastic job. Well, I went back to that hospital. I haven't been back since about a few months ago. Anyone here know Neil Moody? You know Neil Moody passed away? And I was at his funeral. And I visited Neil almost every day. And a woman came out of the... She was one of the nurses that attended me. She came out of a lift, met me, and she gave me a hug. And she said, you know, that letter, I showed it to my father. And he said, that's a wonderful letter. Just an appreciation for what they'd done for me. I met another nurse, and she gave me a hug too. She said, I've seen you before, I know who you are. I think it was the letter that did it. Or maybe it was the bald head, I don't know. Here's another thing. When they sent me home the day they did, they didn't say to me, well, you're on your own now, on your bike, make your own arrangements, on your way. No, they were very concerned for my welfare. They gave me all sorts of instructions on how I should look after myself. I didn't do any of it, by the way, because I thought my diet was better than theirs, but all the things I was supposed to do so I would remain healthy. Would the God of heaven be any different? Oh, no. He said, I've graven you on the palms of my hand with the point of a nail on an old rugged cross. He said, I'll always be with you, even to the end. Unto him who's able to keep you from falling, falling away. That's what it means. I'll keep you if you're willing. And also, they said this to me, if you've got any problems, we want you to come straight back. Don't hesitate. If you've got any pain, just come straight back here. You see, I'm registered on their books now. My name's written there. They know all about my needs. In fact, they know more about me than I know myself. They've looked inside me. I don't want to look inside me, but they've looked inside me. God knows more about me than I know myself. My name is registered there on the page, white and fair. And the book of Malachi said, they shall be mine when I make up my jewels. Direct access to the throne of Almighty God. What a wonderful experience. You know, the book of Revelation is full of sanctuary symbols. It starts with a sanctuary, it ends with a sanctuary. He, Christ is, is dressed as a priest, as a lamb, there's, there's, um, there's the golden candlesticks, and there's the altar, and all sanctuary symbols. One thing is missing. The veil. No veil. See, um, Rather a sobering place, the sanctuary, death, killing, and barriers. They had a barrier for the Gentiles. Any Gentile, they found a notice, by the way, just recently. Any Gentile, an original from the temple, anyone, any Gentile passes this, he'll suffer death. Barrier for the Gentiles, barrier for the women, barrier for the men, barrier for the priests, barrier for the high priests. It's all represented in the veil, and there's no veil there accents to the throne of God. The whole book of God can be summarised in just three words. Forgiveness of sin. That's what it's talking about. To use scriptural reference from the Old Testament, reconciliation for iniquity. That's what it's talking about. 
Well, you might say to me, as um, Richard Dawkins, I've just read Richard Dawkins', Richard Dawkins book, uh, The God Delusion, this is what he says. He says, well, why does it take so much to tell us that God can forgive our sins? You know, this book's about 800,000 words, took about 1,500 years to write, 66 different books, 40 different authors. Why does it take so long and so much to tell us that God forgives your sins? Because we're like God. We ask questions. When Farmer Fred looks at his dog and he says, Spot, go out and fetch the cows, Spot doesn't say there why. Certainly his haunch doesn't say why and how much are you going to pay me. That's the sort of things that we ask. We'd like to know some sort of reason. And you'll notice that God does the same thing at the beginning of Genesis. He asks questions. Where are you? As if he didn't know. Who told you? What have you done? Have you eaten? What have you done? You see, we're made in his image and we ask the same questions. And so the whole book of God is answering the question. How? Why? When? And where? We need to know it. And God has given us little pictures to tell us the how, the why, the when, and the where. But it's all done, but the rest is explanation, you see. It's all done at the cross. The rest is just explanation. That surgeon, when he visited me on his rounds, he said, it was a real mess down there, you know. Every time, he said, that was a big operation. Well, I can see it was a bigger operation. It looked like they used a tomahawk on me by the scar I've got there, and I'll take it to my grave. He said, that was a big... He said, your, your uh, thing was fested so much, and it was stuck to everything else around. It took me about two and a half hours to get it off, let alone get it out. The operation was a complete success. It was all done. The rest was explanation. He was coming to me and telling me what happened. But the operation was done. That's how it is with God and us. He's done it, and he likes to explain the reason and how it was done. There's another aspect of this. Before my operation, they come to, came round to me with a piece of paper, and I had to sign a document to say that I was quite happy that they take... That gallbladder away, and I was glad to get rid of it, I can tell you. Good riddance. I had no problems with that. But that's how it should be. It was my gallbladder, not theirs. And they had to have my permission to take it away from me. And it's the same with God and us. You see, he's too much of a gentleman to take something away from us that we want to keep. So he comes to us and he says, I can forgive your sins, but they're your sins and not mine. You've got to give me the okay to take them all away. And so that's why we're asked to accept him. That's what it means. He can't do it without okay, without our okay. We must allow him. The jailer comes to the condemned man. He said, I've got your pardon. It's got your name on it. Accept it and live. Reject it. Die. But you've got to accept it. And that's how it is with God and us. He's too much of a gentleman to take away from us what is rightfully ours. He needs our permission. They're our sins. But he said, I'll take them. A few years ago, I got in a spot of trouble with the law. And I had to go to court. Now, I didn't say I was perfect. And I'd better tell you what it was all about in case your imagination runs riot. I had a second-hand shop. And um, second-hand dealers have to keep a register of everything they bought off the public in case it was stolen. And the, there was a book, and the police would come in, and they would check your book, and they would check what was on your shop floor. And that fridge had such and such a number on it, and where's the number, and where'd you buy it from? Or there. And uh, the TV and the washing machine and all the rest of the stuff, and they had little numbers on them, and we had to be registered in the book. And they came around once, and they found no number. There was a ring in sitting on my desk. It wasn't in the book, so they threw the book at me. And I had to appear in court. But before the court case, they offered me, they rang me up and they said, you're eligible for a diversion. Now, a diversion means 
that you can go and negotiate with them and you can give a certain amount of money to a worthy cause and that means you wouldn't have a record. Wonderful. You would be absolved. So I can tell you that I really went, I really made sure that my diversion was all in order. But you have to appear in court. So I went to court and uh, my name was called. And I have to admit, it was a little bit with fear and trembling. I went up and stood in the, in the desk and there was the judge across and he looked at my notes and he looked at me and he looked at my notes and he said, I see you've got into a little trouble with that book. But he said, I see you have a diversion. You're free to go. It was a wonderful feeling. Free to go. Before the judge, I'm free to go because I've done something beforehand. A diversion. And our sins can be all diverted and we're free to go. You know, um, in the book of Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'll come in and sup with you. But James says, the judge stands at the door. So we make a decision. Either he comes in and sups with us or we meet the judge. And I thank God that we've all made that decision for him. Well, I went back to the shop and I called all the staff together. And I said, you don't have to worry about the book anymore. It's all, I know the judge down there. He's a right good fella and he'll do anything I say. Don't worry about the book any longer. Did I? That's an apocryphal statement. It's a lie. I went back to the shop and I said, I'm so happy, but I'll tell you what, from now on, we're very careful about that book because they're never going to catch me out again. And I was watching it all the time. You see, that's how it is with us and God. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I had a new heart about that book. It was very important to me. And God says, I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit. But that heart I'm going to give you has got a pacemaker in it. Bible calls it the Holy Spirit. One sent alongside to help. We now, now travel arm in arm with the Lord Jesus Christ. Connected to Christ, you see. And we're in constant contact with him. My pacemaker attached to his heart. It records every one of my needs and he will supply all my needs according to to his riches and glory, riches and glory. One last thing. I met someone after my operation, and in our discussion, I wasn't talking about mine because I got over it, he said, I got a bit of a pain in my stomach. I said, have you really? Yeah, he said, I got a bit of a... When is it? And I started asking questions, whereabouts your pain? I said, I had a pain like that, and I'll tell you what, those people up there at the North Shore Hospital, they fixed me up, and I recommend it. You get straight up there to that hospital. You see, I've been through the experience. And I had some good news to tell him. Someone can fix your problem. You see, Jesus says, go you therefore and teach all nations. What are you going to say to them? I know someone that can fix your problem. He's my friend. He fixed mine. It might be better sometimes saying that we have all the answers. No, I have got the answers, but it's in someone else. Praise, book of Peter, wonderful, the way it begins. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, will never fade away like those fig leaves reserved in heaven for you who are kept by God's power. Isn't it good to be kept by God's power in the maddening maze of things tossed by storm and flood to unsure stake my spirit clings I know that God is good bless you
before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be majesty and glory and power forevermore. In the name of Jesus, amen.